All right, so ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, welcome to another community conversation. Uh, I'm Brandon Middleton, and let me pull up my screen share here to uh, get us kicked off. This is week number 14, I believe, week, week number 15, actually. And this is a class called Introduction to Social Design. And uh, this is brought to you by the Siebel Center for Design at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, today, we've got two very special guests that I'm excited to be able to moderate the conversation with. Uh, but before we go into a little bit of uh, introductions and Q&A with them, let's just level set. Uh, this will be our agenda for today. We'll do a little bit of overview, do the intros, and then we'll get into the fireside chat. Uh, so quickly, you know, I'm Brandon. Uh, by day, I teach uh, design at the University of Illinois and also at Stanford University, uh, their D school. Um, first brand in there on the picture is me at my day job, Amazon Web Services. Uh, I do work with fintech startups by day. So if you heard of Web3 and blockchain and crypto and that kind of stuff, that's what I'm doing from nine to five most days. Uh, in the middle there is uh, my family. I've been married for 12 years and got three rambunctious little children so uh, never a dull moment there and the third picture is supposed to be representative of uh, community branding uh, really love the idea of uh, social impact organizations uh, community and neighborhood you know grassroots efforts that are helping to uplift uh, the community and make it better generation by generation so uh, that's a little bit about me i'll hand it over to my uh, co-instructor bert as well to do to give a quick intro and then we'll keep it moving Bert, over you. Hey all, I'm Bert Chong. Uh, I'm a lecturer at Siebel Center for Design. Uh, so I teach a lot of classes here, including this one that I co-teach with Brandon. Uh, some stuff about my background. I'm an amateur type designer, so you see lots of letters there in the middle. And a lot of my undergrad background was from uh, interactive arts. Uh, and that's all for me. Back to you. All right. Thanks, Bert. Um, and then this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, throughout the course of these last 15 weeks or so, you know, we've been able to interact with so many different nonprofit organizations, community, um, community, you know, groups and clubs and all kinds of uh, stories that we've been able to hear from operators. And it marries kind of the social impact side of design and the kind of practical and tactical design thinking methodologies and human-centered design that we uh, as new designers are focused on. So it's a great kind of synthesis and way to merge the theoretical stuff that you might hear in a university classroom up against kind of the lived experiences of people who are actually trying to bring uh, this kind of change and this kind of impact to, to the community. So uh, today, you know, we'll focus on Don Moyer, uh, Boys and Girls Club, and some of, um, you know, Michael Middleton's experiences uh, abroad and uh, here locally in the States. But uh, we've been really blessed to have been uh, able to get in front of some of these organizations. And hopefully, as folks leave this class, they'll be able to integrate and volunteer and to take the mission of, of each of these organizations forward. All right, so on to the main event. Uh, what I'll do is is pass the popcorn over to Charles first, and then to to Michael. And uh, if you tell the people, kind of, you know, who you are, you know, where you are, what you're focused on, uh, you're tied to the university. Just feel free to take a couple minutes uh, to introduce yourself. Uh, we'll do the intros, and then we'll kick it off with some fun Q and A. So, uh, Charles, I'll pass the popcorn over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, first, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Charles Burton. Uh, I'm the CEO of Don Moyer Boys and Girls Club. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud to be here as an alum, a two-time alum of the University of Illinois, uh, Recreation, Sport, and Tourism. Um, you know, my story is a little interesting. Uh, the, 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 the short version would be um, I was a young, I'm from originally from Louisville, Kentucky, a young person uh, living in there, living in our community. Um, if, you know, I was that person and that kid that walks down the street that you drive by and I felt like everyone who, who looked at me just looked through me like I didn't belong and I didn't exist. And when you have that feeling um, as a young person, uh, you, you, you start to, to make poor decisions. Um, I'm happy, I, I was blessed enough to be with um, some of my friends uh, about to go make a poor decision, walk past the Boys and Girls Club, 
um, a caring adult, a volunteer of a Boys and Girls Club, instead of letting us walk by, spoke to us while this individual was picking up their son, challenged me to a race. I won the race. This individual happened to be a track coach, signed me up for their track team, uh, signed me up for the Boys and Girls Club, uh, checked on me on a weekly basis, made me go to practice, eat healthy, help, uh, eat more healthy. And uh, I became a 32-time state champion, uh, high school All-American, ended up being able to come to the University of Illinois on a track scholarship. Uh, thought I was smart enough to do kinesiology, uh, but uh, I had that uh, Kentucky public school education, so I didn't know everything um, and found out that that was too hard for me. <laughs> um, but I, I, I knew that I liked uh, working with people and doing sports. Um, so I walked out of that class in kinesiology where I knew nothing about ligaments. That was a calf muscle to me. I didn't know anything else and um, went to RST and found out about how um, I can start a career. Wanted to be a sports agent, hung out with David Falk a little bit, and uh, that wasn't the life for me. Um, so I failed up to realize that uh, I didn't I shouldn't focus on that and been able to, uh, you know, serve here in Champaign um, at the Champaign Park District as a director and and uh, been here uh, teaching youth development to the National Guard, which is Challenge Academies of uh, the United States of America, and uh, has, a, has, has had a decent year, a decent career working with youth and trying to positively impact people. Um, I like to tell everyone I'm possible, so I'm a product of my work, um, and I wear that with me every day to make sure every kid can see that it's possible to come from where I came from and how I came from and become something positive. So. That's kind of how I wandered into this work. It, my work found me. <laughs> that's beautiful. And that's like the, the story that each of those logos on that slide before are trying to produce, you know, Charles's uh, and Michael's in the world. So that's, that's great. Thank you for capturing that for us and uh, packaging it and delivering it. Uh, we'll pass the popcorn over to uh, Michael Middleton or Uncle Mike to me. Uh, so... <laughs> microphone over or the popcorn over to you sir so please yes do call me mike um when i'm called michael i feel like i've done something to this point <laughs> uh, um so um a bit like charles grew up in the inner city of chicago um and um a bit of a nerd uh, played chess in high school that's as that was about as athletic as i as i got um had a couple of formative experiences while I was young. One um, kind of experience uh, white flight firsthand. And it's easy to demonstrate when you look at kindergarten, first, second grade, you know, second and third grade pictures. So when we were the first or among the first to integrate our block on the south side of Chicago, you see Mike Middleton in the center, one or two black kids, all the rest white, white folk. Next year, 50% black, 50% white. Next year, 100% black, right? Um, and that profoundly affected me uh, because I thought that there was something I did wrong um, when it came to, you know, creating friends or, you know, so I got this notion that, you know, where black people live, um, uh, white people didn't want to be. So, and, and so there was always a curiosity. I didn't have any strong feelings about that, but it was a curiosity for me to want to understand that dynamic. Um, so when I got off to the University of Illinois, yes, proud University of Illinois, uh, graduated out of the uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, uh, speech communication uh, major with a minor in marketing. Um, I uh, embarked on my first corporate uh, role with um, Procter & Gamble. They taught me a whole lot about um, kind of designing solutions Right for uh, uh, all kinds of things, whether it's diapers or bar soap or, or detergents, uh, and how to uh, kind of create demand. And uh, I, I worked for them for more than a decade, and then went from there to uh, uh, now. I currently work with Shell Lubricants. Um, uh, been in the marketing space, been in uh, the logistics and, and uh, spaces, uh, and done a lot of things. But what what stayed with me was this notion that uh, I did want to kind of engender a uh, better understanding of race relations, I guess I should say, um, and make sure that uh, I was doing my part to uh, help folks want to all, all work together 
because uh, um, this whole balkanization that happens with groups and tribes saddens me a little bit because I think we underutilize our, our power uh, when we uh, don't figure out ways to work together. Another thing I, I have a deep uh, kind of appreciation for um, is kind of giving back and working with the community. Grew up in the church, so I have kind of Christ-centered values, but um, more just kind of servant leadership type values, right? And so I always felt that I had gifts and I, my responsibility was to serve others with the gifts that I have. Um, so, that, <clears throat> so that I ended up doing a lot of community work. Um, I, for the last 30 years, have been involved in Boys' Rights of Passage programs. I've lived in seven or eight different cities in the United States. I've done that work in every city dealing with at-risk youth um, from the ages of, say, 11, 12 through 17. Um, I work with uh, counseling, uh, largely African-American families that are, uh, or potential families that are folks that are contemplating marriage. So I do premarital counseling uh, because I believe in, you know, uh, creating strong black families. Uh, so a lot of my spare time is, is, and I do a lot of uh, kind of missionary work as well. You know, we, we've, uh, involved in some efforts to build schools in uh, Liberia and Kenya and, and uh, with the orphanages and, and so forth. Um, so a lot of my time is devoted to, I guess, corporate, in, in, in the corporate uh, persona that I, that, that I have. Spend a lot of time trying to uh, kind of help colleagues and uh, leadership understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusiveness looks like and feels like for folks that are generally marginalized, marginalized and how to foster better relations. Uh, but secondly, um, spend a lot of time uh, philanthropically helping folks in the inner cities to uh, understand what the possibilities are, whether, whether they choose to be in a corporate setting or a uh, nonprofit setting. Yeah, so that's me. Excellent. Well, thank you both for um, kind of expounding on kind of the background and giving us the context. Uh, if you go into the chat, you'll see a little bit of the context from the students, again, their majors and some of the stuff that they focus on. Um, but I, I want to ask maybe the first question coming over to Charles. You know, you mentioned being like a product and kind of the, the dream realized for like the Boys and Girls Club, like you, you, you are kind of the role model for that. Um, now, as an executive director, like you started working with these um, types of programs and have worked your way all the way up to be like the leader of one. Uh, talk to us about kind of what the day-to-day -day life looks like and, um, you know, how is it to manage, you know, an organization when you started kind of as the uh, recipient of an organization's work and then kind of got in at the ground floor and been moving up ever since. So just just walk us through what it's like to, uh, to sit in that executive director role uh, for the organization right now. Sure, sure. Um... You know, I'll start by saying it's vastly different. You know, I've, I've had the privilege, and particularly at Dom Lawyer, I've, I've now worked in every position except the chief finance officer um, at this organization. So I've worked in all levels. Um, I started at the bottom. Now I'm here literally um, um, as a volunteer. Well, as a kid when I came to U of I. And, um, you know, there's, there's multiple aspects to it. Uh, the first part is, is working with the kids is the fun part. That's the programming side to where that's where the impact really is um, from a program standpoint, because you get to work with the kids, you get to work with the families, you find out what's going on with them. It's that relationship building. It's the relational part um, that's exciting. Once you move up to administration, um, it's less you having your hands on with the youth and families. And it's more of providing opportunities and the environment mm. to breed success, to breed this quality life, to, 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 to inspire and enable. You know, our mission is to inspire and enable all youth, especially those who need us most to reach their full potential as responsible, productive, and caring citizens. Um, your lens changes a little bit once you get into uh, administration because it's more about providing opportunities, you know, having access. So what that means is, is when you had your slides up, just about every slide was a community partner, a Don Warrior Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. um, and you're sitting at the table in all of these uh, different areas of our community to provide, uh, you know, advocacy, 
that's how we advocate for our, our, our youth. Uh, we're an organization, we try not to uh, necessarily be focused on fees. That's why our fee is $20 a year for academic support and our programming because we wanna limit barriers and provide access. Um, we just morphed into providing social workers so you don't, so individuals don't have to worry about insurance when they're coming to receive mental health. Um, and that's the focus of that. Now, if you asked me that 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, wah, 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 because I didn't know anything about all of that. But, <laughs> um, you know, th but that's a part of growth. You know, the, the motto is to sit at the table or be on the menu. Mm -hmm. And and the key, the key is, is that I get to listen to our family stories and I have staff that tell me what's going on and what they're experiencing. And I'm able to articulate that at different tables in different areas of the community um, and throughout the nation, you know, as Boys and Girls Clubs is, is a national brand. So we have our national committees is to articulate these needs and what we're doing and talking to the CEO of Sony and talking to the Major League Baseball Commissioner and, and selling, this is what we do. This is why it's important to support us. And so that's a, that's a key element. Uh, most nonprofits, you think of raising money all the time. Uh, yeah, we raise money. Um, that's a key part of what we do. Um, I, I would like to say I've never asked anyone a day in my life for any finances. It's more of a friendship and a partnership to come together to do something good. You know, career-wise, you know, I, I'm, I'm in Rotary. I'm a Rotarian. You know, and we really look at the, the four-way test as a key element to how we carry out our work. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And is it beneficial to all concerned? And that's kind of the leadership model that, that we use for making decisions and staying mission driven to our organization to create these opportunities to build that relational aspect, which come from trust, respect, you know, um, you know, reciprocal uh, aspects of that trust and respect to build upon the organization. So that's a key element um, of, of, of how that that transaction and, and, and how that works. Um, but a key element is trust. Mm -hmm. um, not just trusting you as an individual, but it's trusting as an organization. You know, is your kid going to be safe? Are we trained? You know, do we have the right professionals there? Mm -hmm. Are we going to follow through? Um, our motto is, is when school's out, the club is in. So we're open on days when schools are out. So mm -hmm. our staff's here from 7.30 in the morning until 9.30 p.m. providing services to help families be able to go to work. Uh, we're about to purchase a career vocational software for uh, parents who are currently unemployed to have opportunity to find out what their career vocational uh, uh, career, career vocational aspirations are. It's not just about helping the kids. It's a holistic approach for the families. And that's what separates Boys and Girls Clubs from other, other organizations. So really looking at other things and trying to stay relevant every day. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's been experiencing COVID, mental health-wise or whatever. You've had to pivot over and over and over again. Um, so that's a key element of, of, of being in an executive director role is, is how do you stay relevant with the ever-changing environment, which changes for us by the hour, not by the day. And so how do you stay relevant and, 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 and keep your conversations and maintain your mission? So uh, you know, I'll stop there, but that, that's an overview. Yeah, that's super helpful. And like as designers, you know, we've talked about narrative and kind of the power of storytelling throughout, you know, the semester. We've talked about uh, the students right now are, you know, they're getting ready to pitch for their final project. There's a pitch presentation this coming Tuesday to take uh, their skills of being able to capture and gather data, to be able to work with interviewees and to be able to synthesize and like present uh, for, you know, compelling, powerful argument as to why, you know, Charles, to your point, an organization across from the table should partner with their idea. So um, very, you know, relevant things that you call out that, you know, would resonate with the students who are working on their presentations over this weekend and will present them on Tuesday. So yeah, thank you for that. And I want to come to Mike with a similar question about, um, you know, as you look at the resources that you've needed, you know, throughout your career, you know, maybe leaving U of I to get to the point where you're at right now. Uh, how have you thought about the design process, uh, the storytelling, um, getting access to the resources that you saw as necessary in order to make the kind of impact uh, and to use your gifts in the way that 
you know, your, your family could be proud of, like, uh, walk us a little bit through kind of your journey of, of gathering what you need in order to be successful and impactful. Yeah, Pro probably cultiv cultivated a little bit of that um, at the University of Illinois. I, I think at an early age, I knew I wanted to go kind of in a, in a, in a field where I wanted to persuade people to do something or other. Um, and, and so I kind of had an early image of myself being involved in advertising or marketing or um, kind of, you know, uh, writing slogans and putting together campaigns and things like that. Didn't really do much of that in high school, but blossomed when I really got to the University of Illinois and got my first um, kind of taste of freedom. <laughs> and um, I did a lot of stuff. I, I threw myself into everything that would allow me to learn about um, you know, kind of my, my gifts and how people will respond to me. Uh, I, I, I did some DJing work, um, you know, DJ house parties. I did some on, I was an on-air personality at uh, University of Illinois uh, for a couple of years. Uh, I, I wrote copy for the Daily Illini. I, I did voiceover stuff. So everything that was involved with kind of communicating to people, I threw myself into. Um, <clears throat> And so, I, and, and I had a, a full-time job, well, part-time job at Sears and, you know, uh, at, at the mall there and found that I was pretty successful in driving people to, um, you know, get what they needed. Um, and so I got, uh, as, as I had a combination of kind of an education and exploring as well as kind of getting some relevant outside experience, you know, in performance in the way of getting paid for doing things that, um, you know, use my gifts and talents. I, I, I then learned that, wow, this is, uh, you know, there's, there's no limits, right? And, and if I can just figure out the formula uh, for how do I connect up what I have to offer with what people are, you know, needing, then that's, uh, that, that puts me in a good space. So did a lot of cultivating of you know, and experimentation, I guess, at University of Illinois. Um, and then when I got my first job, it was quite by accident, I think, uh, working for, I, I wasn't really seeking, frankly, I didn't even know who Procter & Gamble was. If you had told me that I was going to accidentally get hired by the number one marketer in the world, you know, or certainly within the United States, and they were going to train me for the next, you know, 10, 15 years in how to influence people, you know, it, that was all, you know, happenstance. It didn't happen because I tried to make it happen. It happened because, you know, I was just an accident, ac accidentally stumbled into something that, you know, helped me uh, uh, further this kind of loose aspiration. Um, I always had a pretty good notion that I could influence individuals and influence people. Um, and again, because I went into the sales, you know, into a, a sales role, um, you know, it was very tangible to get paid for, for doing that. Um, I, I currently am designing solutions uh, for our customers. I, I've always gravitated towards being crystal clear on who, who my customer is, um, whether it's a consumer coming through the, the doors at Sears, uh, whether it was somebody, you know, moving to the beat on the dance floor, uh, or whether it was uh, uh, my, my uh, um, I guess say industrial customers that help that I'm helping to design solutions for in terms of their them procuring our goods uh, through electronic means as opposed to uh, uh, you know uh, less electronic means. Um, so once I stay focused on the customer and I, and I uh, adopted a principle and a pretty good track record in being able to do that, persuading people really is about uh, to 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 provide resources is really about helping them have a vision for how clear the, you know, have a clear vision of who the customer is, what the customer desires. And sometimes that's tricky because they don't necessarily know what they want. So you have to do some, you know, some research to really tease out, you know, folks that, you know, kind of know intrinsically, but they don't necessarily know how to articulate what they want. Um, and, then, and then perhaps uh, designing solutions and designing products uh, to, to give them that. Uh, so my stakeholders, uh, most of the my stakeholders at, at my current company are engineers. They're, they're very technically oriented. 
Um, so I brought a skill set that they didn't have. I brought, you know, a, a focus on the customer or the consumer, and I brought uh, a comfort with that world, uh, and I brought success in how to to motivate uh, those uh, the organization to deliver uh, kind of better performance by focusing on on the customer and the consumer. Um, so I've been I've been involved in designing all kinds of, you know, whether it's programs for youth or whether it's advertising campaigns uh, for urban mindset individuals uh, uh, and, and enthusiasts for in the automotive space, um, or packaging, right? That is uh, about, I, you know, I live in an energy world, and here we are trying to figure out ways to decarbonize, right, as the world is moving more to decarbonization solutions. So I'm saying, how can we consider uh, 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 removing you know, or moving to more recycled packaging as opposed to uh, using more of the Earth's resources, resources uh, and, and not using them to the to uh, maximum effect. Um, so that's where, where I've been involved, and that's what my typical day, uh, whether I'm doing kind of the philanthropic side of work or the council side of work or the uh, uh, motivational side of work or the business problem solving side of work, I'm really using the same principles and it's focusing on the, the consumer or whoever our target is and trying to tease out what they really desire and want and offering that in such a way that um, it's good for everybody, right? Because, I mean, there's lots of things we can market, but if we market things and we know they have negative consequences, uh, that's not good for anyone in the long run. So that's how I balance kind of my kind of uh, ethical and, and uh, spiritual training, even as I bring that, you know, to solutioning for, and, and I would encourage, I, I know I'm just you know, talking to students, so as, as you all think about, you know, you have choices, right? You have choices about how you design and what you design. So make sure that, you know, you have a strong, uh, um, you're clear about what you want to achieve and on a human level as, as much as, you know, just to get paid or to satisfy some key stakeholders. And, and I think that's an important uh, consideration as well. Yeah, with our community, and I'll invite, you know, folks that are listening to, to chat in some questions uh, using the Zoom chat. But to that particular point, like in the beginning, uh, first project, you know, we put out a number of social issues that are affecting society, whether it's, you know, access to education or whether it's climate in the environment, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, violence or poverty. And uh, there's a there's been so many projects uh, throughout project number one and number two, and I know what they're focused on for project three that have to do with that climate change, the environment, the carbonization and decarbonization that you're talking about. So um, I think this generation for sure has that at the forefront of their mind, um, maybe in a way that generations prior uh, did not. So I'm hopeful there. Uh, so coming over to you, Charles, with the question about um, the way that you've designed programs. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if I heard somebody, was somebody coming off to, to ask a question? Maybe not. So Charles, the question I've got for you is about um, the way that you think about design of programs, you talked about having to uh, be adaptable with the days and the times and you know hour by hour, minute by minute. Um, as a consumer of these programs, from you know a boy and a teenager and a young adult to now the person that approves them and kind of gets them delivered, how have you thought about designing? What's your process for for green lighting something versus saying, hey, that's not ready uh, for us to ship and deploy yet? Take us through a little bit of uh, the journey in terms of how you're thinking about delivering this impact, you know, through programs with that design lens on. Sure, sure. Um, you know, there's a multitude of factors. Uh, programming that I went through uh, 30 some years ago, way different in the day. Uh, <laughs> uh, boys, the Boys and Girls Club back in the day was roll out a ball and you, you played open gym all day. Uh, um, <laughs> You know, we're, we're more focused now, um, you know, um, you know, I'll start with meeting the need. When you're looking at program design, you want to have it relevant 
and you want to have it have a positive impact on the community, whatever it may be. Um, it's easy to justify, you know, an impact, um, but you want to have the maximum impact for your resources. You know, mm -hmm. us as an organization, 85% of every dollar goes to a kid. Mm -hmm. We make sure that um, it doesn't go to, to my salary or any other administrator's salary. It directly goes towards supporting kids. And the, and the rationale behind that is, is it goes into that trust and that design method of what we're doing here. We need our impact and our, our resources to go towards impact. Mm -hmm. um, for us now, you know, as a Boys and Girls Club nationwide, you know, COVID has a learning gap. COVID has a huge learning gap. There was already a learning gap for underserved youth prior to COVID. But now that stretched all the way across the board due to, um, you know, lack of services, lack of opportunities. Everyone's not positioned to go to school or go to class via Zoom. And I don't know if I could do it. I struggle with meetings, nonetheless, trying to have to go all day. <laughs> um, you know, how do, how do we make that re uh, relevant? How do we make learning fun? We're closing that gap. Uh, understanding mental health. You know, one of the things a lot of, a lot of, you know, when you think about COVID and using a Zoom, well, it also exposed home life and background. You had kids trying to go to class and had things going on behind them that were inappropriate, right? And so for some kids going to school, that's where they get breakfast. That's where they get lunch. That's where they feel safe for seven and a half, eight hours a day. Uh, to have that taken away it was a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was a game changer. So, you know, for us, from a design standpoint, we owned a facility. We knew that we could control our facility and do what we could do with sanitation. And so we wanted to provide essential services for families who needed it the most, who wanted to work, but didn't have a plan, no one to watch their children. We took them to class. So we served 42 schools. Mm. We signed up every kid to their classes. So we supervised them, provided breakfast, lunch, and snack and gave them a respite from being enclosed in your house because you were enclosed in your house for a long time. Yeah. And so we felt that our program design and our resources would be best used by providing you know, uh, fresh produce for families who needed food, you know, non-perishables, providing that service of breakfast and lunch and that academic support and tutoring, uh, that mentorship. And then for the kids and families that didn't need it, we wanted to provide just that respite to just be a kid. Um, you know, one of the questions in the chat was what's happening with youth today. It, it, it's a situation where truthfully we can't throw money at it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you look at, at youth for two years, you know, for me, I'll just use my story. There was a caring adult that coached me in track and that was a person that got me on track and maintained everything for me. Well, how many AAU teams and soccers and baseballs and tracks or, or boys and girls clubs or youth centers or whatnot that were closed to where that caring adult who was the role model for, you know, said youth was taken away. So for two years, you had that connection severed. And, you know, typically in business, it's like, oh, you're able to come back in your office. So you just come back in your office and everything works. Well, with kids, their routine, you, you know, crisscross applesauce, standing out on the right side in the hallway. You know, when you put all of those things in there that that lead to being a res responsible, productive, and caring citizen, how do you build those back up and what you do every day to be successful? The kids who are able to be in programs are the most successful kids now that the school went back into session because they were used to a routine. They were used to dealing with individuals and being told yes and no, and this is the way to look at things and have that support. Those that didn't struggle because that routine, that developmental routine. Uh, right now, K through third, you hear about K through third programming. The majority of youth aren't going to read it the proper uh, reading it in math at the after third grade. And they and studies show after third grade, it's too late. Yeah. What can we do to close those gaps? So when we're looking at that, we're looking at what's the return on investment, what's the impact that we can make. You know, but also with being a nonprofit, you have to think about the funding aspect of it as well. You have to think about the funding aspect of it. How can you maintain this impact and serve as many as possible in the safest way as possible and the most convenient way as possible to meet that need any way possible? <laughs> so, 
So it's a lot of possibilities in that. And so really, really just going through that and looking at your return on investment, you know, using the four-way test, you know, keeping that principle there and making sure that whatever you do, you're able to do it well. It's really easy to see needs and get so convoluted. We could do this, 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 you know, and be the master of nothing. It's real easy to get caught up with that. And uh, so you want to be good at what you what you do because it matters and that impact matters. And you don't want to promise that you can do this and have a flash in the pan type of situation where it was good for a week when that service was needed for a year. Yeah. And so that, that all, a, lot, a lot of those things and those those ideals go into the thought process with what we do um, as a leader. I am not the smartest person in the room. I will share that always. My responsibility is to get the right talent in the room and ask the right questions. It's not to be the smartest person in the room. It's not to know it all. Suddenly say no, coach to a yes. Um, you know, and, and never let a good crisis go to waste. It challenges your perspective. It challenges you know, any misconceptions that you may, you know, you hear you can't, you can't, you can't, then COVID happened. And then all of a sudden, yes, we could. And so it, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste and find out, you know, fail forward, fail forward. You know, I always tell staff, fail with flair, you know, you know, <laughs> fail with flair, you know, just, just go 10 toes down in it. And then we'll learn from it and be better and become better uh, based upon that. Um, but that means at least we know we're passionate about what we're doing when you go 10 toes down and, you know, we'll all go off the cliff together. But, uh, <laughs> and I, I say it jokingly, but that, that's, the, that's the reality. We can't have fear, right? We, we, we can't have false expectations appearing real. We have to find ways to meet the need. And so really doing a SWOT analysis, that's the one thing that I will say. Every situation, the four-way test is another version, this is version of doing a SWOT analysis, but your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats and really looking at that in all situations and then taking that instead of using weaknesses that's an area for improvement and how do you take that and coach that to a yes to yeah. benefit whatever it may be uh, there's always a way so um you know that's that's just kind of the thought process on a global scale yeah i'm gonna have to steal some of those uh those phrases and turn <laughs> these uh Hope you don't have them trademarked, but yeah, that's a great, like, I mean, what, what do we as designers do other than like make really bold questions, you know, in a short iteration, try out crazy stuff and learn from it and then like iterate with the next prototype. So that uh, failing fast, 10 toes down, like, you know, drive fast off the cliff before you jump, like a, a lot of those analogies are uh, parallel to what we've been kind of building the students up towards uh, throughout the semester. So it's great to hear some of those frameworks thrown out and great to hear um, in my mind that they're cross-functional. Like you don't have to be like super deep in design or super deep in advertising or marketing. You can be in nonprofit, you can be in many different areas and still go with some of these same ideas. So yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I wanna extend kind of Taylon's question and some of like the local that Charles talked about to uh, maybe some of the work, Mike, that you've been able to do like on the continent as it pertains to like, are the challenges similar when you're trying to educate, um, you know, African youth as opposed to American youth? Uh, what's different? What's the same? How'd you do the SWOT analysis before you flew over there to make an impact in a, a different place? You know, you didn't grow up there but uh, you got a heart for that area of the world. So double click on some of that for us um, with. Yeah, well, um, uh, I'll give you a kind of a tale of two cities here. Um, so right in the middle of COVID, I guess it was last summer. Yeah, we, 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 we made our second trip to Kenya. Um, you know, my church has an orphanage there. We have a, uh, anywhere from 30 to 40 kids. Um, and it was the second time seeing our kids. Um, you know, the, the first time was uh, the year prior. Um, and despite all of the cautions, right? Oh, you don't want to travel. You need to be triple vaccinated. 
<laughs> you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we made it over there, and it was, um, frankly, um, what it, it what it taught me was um, when you're going to do good work, uh, love finds its way everywhere, right? You know, and those kids uh, were um, happy to see us show up. Uh, happy to see the continuity because my wife and I both went over. So uh, since they're orphans, they rarely see kind of husband and wife teams. And so that was really powerful for, you know, a husband and wife to come back, somebody that they knew. Uh, they didn't really have a sense of the risk, you know, that um, the world says we were taking, you know, and going over. We spent about 10 days, you know, doing projects, working with them uh, after, uh, you know, kind of the assignments were over in school, you know. Uh, so building relationship and just, uh, you know, learning from them. I mean, they, they taught me phrases and, and, um, and, and things that I still kind of lovingly uh, use today. So, so as, as successful as that was in going over and engaging despite all of the, you know, risks, um, and there's nothing that substitutes for communicating uh, directly um, uh, with folks and showing uh, showing how you care, um, and 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 pushing through the you know pushing through that first you know kind of hesitation, say you know is this really worth doing? And I would absolutely say absolutely. And frankly, um, it, it it it's it's taught me a lot about what I'm capable of doing when I'm willing to do. Now contrast that to some of the work that we've done um, through the church with our Boys' Rights of Passage ministry and with our, um, uh, our premarital counseling ministry, because it was centered about, you know, around the church and it was a gathering place, um, the church made the decision to shut down. So therefore, the ministries shut down and we struggled with this whole Zoom communication process, particularly the teenage boys. I'm telling you, the last thing they wanted to do was go to school on Zoom five days a week and then kind of go to the Boys' Rights of Passage school, <laughs> you know, on Saturday and listen to 30 adult men drone on about, you know, some of the, you know, um, you know, some of the things that we were trying to trying to teach, whether it was understanding, you know, you know, markets or whether it was how to tie a tie or, you know, properly wear your clothes or, you know, speak with authority. Uh, all of those things were lost in translation as we kind of lost our gathering spot. Um, and frankly, it was the toughest. And did we, did, did we learn? Yeah, we did. We, we, we learned that that was a, a, a colossal failure trying to do what we do without that human touch and that human interaction to engage those boys in a way that they want to be engaged, right? You know, many of them don't have, you know, fathers, many of them don't have adult, you know, male figures in their lives. Uh, and that's something that we took for granted, you know, when we were kind of meeting face to face and, and, and so forth. So, um, so I'm, I'm much more courageous now knowing that if we did this for Africa and traveled, you know, multiple continents through Europe to, you know, to, the African continent and, you know, hours to get there, took all those risks. Why couldn't we have the same mindset when it came to our kids, you know, to, you know, just make sure that we were safe and they were safe. So there's, there's real barriers and there's artificial barriers. And I think that frankly, through this COVID uh, pro uh, process, we, we ran into some artificial barriers um, that we weren't willing to, to kind of press through. And now knowing what I know, I probably do some things differently. I think, Zoom's a great tool, um, but you can't administer. It's, it's very difficult to serve others in a very human-centered kind of focus um, and connect through, you know, mediums that don't allow you to, you know, communicate non-verbally, that don't allow you to, um, you know, kind of touch and interact in, in, a, in a way. So, again, it, 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 it profoundly affected me in terms of what I'm willing to do and how far I'm willing to go to kind of maybe break some some eggs <laughs> in order to make some omelets. Um, um, and and even as as I is you know part of what we're dealing with now is you know Shell has a lot of assets and I'm gonna kind of pivot a bit 
they have a lot of assets in Europe, uh, particularly in Poland, uh, in the Ukraine. Um, you know that it's not okay when I have colleagues that have people at the front fighting, you know, for their freedom, and me not to pause and acknowledge the human agony that they're going through and the and the trauma that they're going through. Um, so as hard as that is to do via a Zoom call, uh, we do it. But it at least, you know, it's taught me how to, you know, think human first, right? Um, business has to take a back seat to acknowledging that people aren't safe and people uh, aren't psychologically okay, right? Um, so a lot of the, the, the pattern of our meetings have changed you know, to really check and make sure people are okay. And that's really what we're talking about here is how do you, what links are we willing to go and what norms are we willing to break to make sure that people are okay before we continue the design work? Because the most important part of design is making sure that you are getting people's best ideas, best thinking. Um, and that happens, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, a work process that only happens when people are comfortable, right? So we have to acknowledge that. And that, that's what I'm learning, whether it's dealing with kids that are a continent away or dealing with kids that are 15 minutes away. And there's nothing that could have, we should have been better. You know, my Boys Rights of Passage team should have been better at getting into our cars, masking up and going to, we only had, you know, less than ten, a dozen kids. We could have went to their houses and, and, and dealt with them individually, at least gave them a hug or a high five or something to kind of establish that. And we, we just weren't creative enough. So it's challenged me to think about, you know, how do we, again, break down artificial barriers and deal with real ones. Um, and I would, you know, as, as I'm talking to future designers and, and current designers, um, same thing, uh, find a way to engage the target, engage your customer, engage your consumer, despite whatever obstacle you have. Yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I love that. And uh, again, we'll invite, you know, people with questions to throw them into the chat. Um, Charles, I want to come to you with one that this is probably one of my favorite questions that I ask every every week about kind of words that you would have for your younger self as, you know, many students are sitting out here, um, some getting ready to graduate, some getting ready to advance from, you know, one grade to the next one. Um, as you've been out as an alumni for a little bit, uh, take the context of today and give some some bars or some wisdom to the younger version of yourself. What would you tell your 18, 19, 20 year old self today if you were in their shoes? Ooh, good question. Um, you know, one of my mentors shared something with me um, when I first started my career um, right after right after graduation. And, you know, it, 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 it resonated with me, but it didn't because I was young. You know, you think you got eternity uh, <laughs> when you first come out, you know. Um, but that the message was, was, Charles, always remember that you interview for your next opportunity every day. Hmm. And, you know, it's like, yeah, little old me, it doesn't matter. But you literally are interviewing for your next opportunity um, every day. Um, and, and, and to put that in context, you know, I've interviewed for different positions, you know, how you treat the person at the front desk, the receptionist, you know, how, when you go to lunch, what you're ordering. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the, it's the whole context of how you handle yourself when you feel no one's looking. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, opportunities can come at any time. The best opportunities come when you're not looking for them. And those opportunities come because you have been interviewed, you know, working with kids, you're a role model, whether you want to or not. It's not an option to choose. You're a role model just by being present or being somewhere. Someone's always looking up to you. Um, you know, I ran track. There was a freshman that looked up to me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old with my gray hairs. I had to cut my hair off because I was getting all the grays, right? And he's like, man, I watched you and learned how to work. And it was just like, wow, you know, we, we ran together, you know, and, 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 you know, you're interviewing for your next opportunity um, every day. 
and be who you needed when you were 10. You know, my whole career has been geared based upon that because when my life changed by that individual, I was 10. Mm. And so I, I, I really use that as be who you needed to be or be what or who you needed when you were 10. We've all had some circumstance in our life, no matter where we come from. It may not be 10, it may be 13, or it may be six, but be who you needed at that moment. Um, and, 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 do, and, 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 and approach everything with kindness, trying to be helpful, not harmful. You know, uh, less, less pointing fingers, tell me more. You know, that's my trauma informed lens, <laughs> you know, um, you know, just, just those things, but literally you interview for your next opportunity, you know, every day and even throughout COVID, you know, I, I've just seen that more and more and more as the workplace has shifted as you're designing the workplace has shifted now, mm-hmm. you know, we're not looking for the same skill sets that we were just three years ago. And it's amazing that I'm saying that three years ago, like it's been a long time, but it's, it's a drastic change. And so uh, I, I always try to keep that in, in, the, in the back of my mind. And any young person, I say it to my kids all the time at the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, well, they get a lot of things from me. But my favorite one is, I love you enough for you to hate me, is the first one. And the, <laughs> and the second one uh, is you interview for your next opportunity every day. You never know who's walking through this facility or who's walking in with you that may be looking for your skill set. Yeah, I love that. Um, and it's it's funny, like the thing that uh, we've all been through and experienced is the same thing that's kind of transformed the expectation of employers and community organizations. And I, I told the students once or twice throughout this semester that, you know, you got to give yourself credit for adjusting and adapting and being malleable. So that's like a testimony that you have and a story that you have that, you know, that we don't necessarily because we didn't have the pandemic as part of our college or, you know, university experience. So it's, it's a great call out and something that I hope, you know, they cling on to and are able to draw strength from as they're interviewing for their next opportunities and stuff like that. But um, same question over to Mike. I'd love to, to hear you talk to your younger self um, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, what, what would you tell him? Wow. <laughs> um, wow. As I, as I look back over probably the things I'm most proud of, that kind of gives me a clue, even though I probably will ramble a bit about what I would say. Um, and maybe if, if there's a recurring theme, it's, it's those things that scared me that I leaned into, you know, uh, that were the most rewarding. So where I took the biggest risk, perhaps, um, you know, and so, but I didn't kind of tiptoe into the water when I took those risks, I jumped off the cliff, right? There was no going back. Um, and so I, I think that's the, you know, that's one of the things that like, don't think about it too long, you know, leave your best game on the court, make the decision and, and go for it. Don't, don't think about, I could have, would have, should have. Um, so that, that, that would be one thing that comes to mind. Uh, that you, I think the other thing is put in work, right? Work hard at whatever it is that you do. So again, if you're doing stuff that you really don't enjoy and you can't put hard effort into it, then Find something you do enjoy and put hard effort into it, because um, you don't get the you don't get those days back, you don't get that time back. Um, so, you know, just just go hard for whatever it is that you think you know you want to do. Uh, make be make a decision and go for it. Um, uh, on the uh, kind of um, uh, uh, kind of philosophical or spiritual side, I'd say, be a good neighbor, mm-hmm. right? And there's, there's, you know, um, my faith teaches me, you know, about the good Samaritan, right? Um, and every time that story is told, I 
I think about the people that walk by someone who is in need, right? Everybody in this world feels like that at some point that, you know, hey, I'm in a ditch, bleeding, hurt, and I see people walking past me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and everybody appreciates the person that stops by, you know, no matter how different or has empathy and engages. So um, whatever you do in your work, you know, and so I call it being a good neighbor. Some might say be loving, right? You know, that because that is the power that moves people um, to do great things. So I would say you make yourself a good neighbor. If there's somebody you don't know as a perspective that you don't understand, mm -hmm. go befriend somebody and say, teach me, be humble enough to listen and learn and, you know, so that I can, you know, be a better friend, so that I can be a better neighbor, so that I can be a better helper. Um, given what we're going through the, in this country with, you know, kind of the tribalization that's happening everywhere, I think that uh, what's missing from a lot of the solutions and strategies is a, a desire to, you know, it is empathy and a desire to really walk in the other person's shoes. Um, and sometimes that, those small acts of understanding and kindness unlock, you know, power in, in us. So I would, I would say is I, if, if I had to learn that earlier, um, instead of kind of, following the the tribe or you know what i what i thought was the right i probably could have been more powerful and impactful earlier and for longer right i i found my way to that today right but then uh, i think i missed uh, some opportunities to 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 inspire along the way so so i would say on the kind of that spiritual side you know just be a be a good neighbor and take that risk and go love somebody that might be hard to love or unlovable, you know? Excellent. Well, um, at this point, what I'll do, I'm gonna ask one more question, but we'll have like a little bit of an interlude and a break. I pulled up a video uh, of the Don Moyer Boys and Girls Club that I'll share for a couple minutes, uh, but just to seed you with the next question, Charles, uh, it's gonna be about resources, books, like how you, um, stay educated, recommendations for resources that you might have for the students um, as they go along, you know, their educational academic design journeys. So uh, I'm coming for both of y'all with that question, but right now we'll take a little bit of a pause and go to this uh, YouTube greatness that I found. So here we go. Uh, You know, I work at the club because of the mission that the Boys and Girls Club has, and that's to uh, enable all youth, particularly youth who need us most, to realize their potential as uh, caring, productive, uh, responsible citizens. What makes me want to get up in the morning and come to work is because I know that every day that I come to work, I'm going to run into a kid who needs someone to help them see life differently, maybe who needs someone to sit down and have a conversation, who needs someone to help them with a, a homework assignment uh, that, they may be, that they may be struggling with, uh, who needs someone just to care. When I wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing on my mind is, what seed am I gonna plant today? And what I mean by seeds is, is that's what we do here at the club. We plant seeds. We introduce, we develop, and we transform lives. What attracts me to the Don Moyers Boys and Girls Club most would be the uh, ability to give directly back to the community and see a, uh, an instant result, meaning um, we can see the work that we do, the hard work that we do, uh, resulting in the kids, uh, benefiting the kids almost immediately. Uh, and it's all about the children. I like coming to the club because it feels like a home. It really feels like a home. And like 
the people here actually tells me that they support and like actually tell me that hey you're gonna be somebody instead of just saying you have to do this in order to be somewhere so the support i get and like how people believe in me here gives me um, motivation to be the best i can be i've been coming to the club since I was six years old, so about 10 years. And what impacted me at the club is, well, I think Mr. Charles, because I look up to him, he's a leader, and you know he helps me out when I need help. He shows me right from wrong, and I believe that changed me. The most important thing about my job, uh, probably sounds cliche, is just the kids, you know, seeing them excited and energetic about the stuff that we work so hard to, you know, give them opportunities to do. And just seeing them be really thankful and proud that they get to take part in, you know, the stuff that goes on here at Don Moyer. The club needs change to me, you know, and, and just, you know, giving the kids something different and showing them that it's so many opportunities and it's so many people here to encourage and who have your back and who care about you. Well, you know, as I sit here uh, and, and see where the club is today, uh, I'm just so excited seeing the kids uh, when I walked in. Uh, they're just uh, having fun. Uh, they're involved, they're engaged, and seeing their smiling faces as well as the uh, staff and the volunteers, their smiling faces, uh, it gets no better than that. And that's really what it's all about. The club makes me feel like, it makes me feel like I'm at home. It's like another home that I've come to. The problems I had when I was a child, Mr. Charles or Mr. Tommy always came through and helped me. And it's like a family that I can count on. People here loves me and I love them too. It gives me a feeling that a real family should have. And I feel like I am surrounded by the people I love here. So Mr. Charles was not lying. He has had every job. That was a uh, director of operations, Charles, a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> Get back to the slides here. Um, I'll go back into this last one that I had to present. Tough time hearing you, uh, Brandon. Uh oh. Can you hear me now? Mic check one two one two. Very okay, thanks. This one thing. Let's see. Okay, I turned the mic up. Can you all hear me now? Mic check one, two, one, two. All right, cool. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect, perfect. Um, I just wanted to fast forward one before I ask this last question and just say thank you to uh to Charles and to Mike for the time here. Uh hopefully this five minutes or so has given you some uh, some last resources and you know you know things to offer to the students as we get ready to part ways here, um, but yeah, Charles, I'll put the question to you first about kind of maybe recommended podcasts or books or things for students to check out, and I'll come to Mike with the same thing. Uh, we'll talk, take a group selfie after that, and then we'll get everybody out of here. So, uh, Charles, I I pass the popcorn over to you for that last question about resources and like things to potentially check out and do for homework after this uh, semester is out. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, from, you know, a leadership standpoint, um, always trying to work on a craft, trying to always trying to work on my craft, right? Um, you, there's never one way to communicate. Um, you know, I'm blessed enough to have a, a wonderful board, but I report to 33 different people. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a different way of communicating. Um, and it, it's, it's a blessing though. Um, you know, one of my favorite books is uh, Purpose Driven Life, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, by Rick Warren. That is a perfect book. You know, I got it right here. It's near to me all the time. Uh, you know, another
another book is A Billion Hours of Good, because I always want to stay focused to what we're doing and how we can stay focused. And, you know, as a Boys and Girls Club kid, you know, a lot of times we forget the success stories that we have. Here's Denzel's book, you know, A Hand to Guide Me of Inspirational Boys and Girls Club Stories mm. of individuals where a mentor and a positive uh, role model has, has positively impacted, you know, their life. And, you know, that's the focus at the end of the day is, is to try to positively impact um, everyone's life that you meet. In, in, in a productive way um and a lot of times from even a boys and girls club I, i'll say to volunteers don't overthink your volunteerism mm -hmm. this individual spoke to me and changed my whole life i think when we hear stories oftentimes we really think i have to do this and i have to give 100 hours of this and i have to do that but if someone's really going through something we were talking about empathy we we're talking about trauma you know suicide prevention Sometimes just speaking can make a world of a difference. And, and, I, and I go full circle to when I first was introducing myself, walking down the street, you see the cars go by and people look at you, but it, you feel as if they're looking through you and they're not seeing you there. Just to have that acknowledgement that I see you, you're present, can go a long way um, and, 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 and do that. We teach cultural competency by giving tours a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, to break down barriers, to have those, 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 those conversations. And they don't have to be constructive or, you know, high octane because it's just organic. It's good people doing good work, working with good kids. You know, I've never met a, I've never met a bad kid a day in my life. Never will. You know, um, our response, you know, the learning style, and if you really want to learn a learning system for a boys and girls club, it's passion, purpose, potential, and pathways. Centennials and millennials will not operate and do anything unless they understand, it's, unless they're passionate about it and they understand the purpose. Mm -hmm. That's part of the youth development strategy right now, passion and purpose. Once you get through those things, now we can talk about potential and then develop strategies on the pathways and steps it takes to achieve your goals. And we use that model, whether you're five years old, whether you're 17 years old, and in the community, I'm doing it whether you're 35, 56, you know, 70. Morgan Freeman didn't get his first acting gig until he, he was long in a tooth and well seasoned. Mm -hmm. It's never too late. But find out and do what you're passionate about and find your purpose. You may lose your way a few times. We all have. But when you find out what you're passionate about, it seems to always work out. You know, I put in the chat, you know, whenever you feel like giving up, always remember your success rate has been 100%. Look back over everything you've ever uh, overcome. Mm -hmm. All of those feelings, all of that time, he's like, I'm never going to make it through this. And you did. Yep. And that's what we have to provide to our kids. That's what we have to provide in our communities. We can overcome anything working together. Individually, we're raindrops. Together, we're an ocean. And uh, lots of bars in there. I'm glad we're recording this so I could like rewatch this again and again and again. <laughs> All right, same same uh, question over to you, Mike. What kinds of things uh, would you offer up to the community here, to the students, um, to, to to use as resources as they continue down their path? Well, um, cer certainly, I you know at 35 years in business now. Um, I'm still curious and I still learn and I still ingest tons and tons of um, any form of uh, education, right? To, to make myself better at, at what I'm asked to do for uh, corporations as well as for uh, philanthropic organizations. Um, if you ask me what is the... Um, uh, most impactful book I have read and continue to read is the Bible. And I've got 12 versions right here on my iPhone, <laughs> you know, um, because it's rich with um, stories that um, not only motivate me, but <clears throat> um, challenge me to be better than I am. And I think that's ultimately what, what we're trying to do is be, you know, better today than we were yesterday. Of ourselves. 
Um, you know, I'm an MBA, so I can spot out a whole bunch of books that, you know, I could say were profound, but I'm more of a practitioner. So frankly, I'd rather do leadership than read about it. But I do think that there are some, some good books out there that, you know, you know my, my MBA is 20 years old, so it probably won't be very helpful if I start spouting stuff off. Um, but, but I do think that it's important to continue to be a lifelong learner, mm -hmm. continue to uh, find ways to sh um, get sharper at whatever it is you choose to do. That's why I say don't spend any time, you know, uh, half doing anything, right? You know, don't, don't, be, don't, be, don't play scared. Uh, it's just you lose, right? And you, you, you waste time. Play to win. And so therefore, and therefore, if one of my old mentors says the universe cooperates with a made up mind, mm -hmm. right? So if, if, if you are focused, um, you will tra attract all the resources you need for the job at hand. Um, so that's the, the one thing I, I'll, I'll leave with you is, is that's the most important decision you're going to make is, you know, am I giving my best? Am I giving my all? And if not, you know, uh, where can I place myself so that I can give my best and give my all? Because, you know, 99 and a half won't do. Yeah. yeah. So I'll leave it there. Love it. Love it. Well, um, I'll go off of screen share here. And again, on behalf of, you know, the whole team of students here, um, want to say just thank you. So feel free to grab some emoji for, for Mike and for Charles here and throw it into this and then I'm gonna start to ready ourselves for our our our, uh, our selfie that we take every week. So if you want to come off of uh, non-camera mode and onto camera mode, I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. I'll start to count down from um, you know five. I'll get some people on here. Five, four, three, two, and one. Here we go. All right, so we got a good uh, good showing today, uh, just on behalf of us, you know, from the Siebel Center of Design here at the University of Illinois. Um, this has been enlightening, you know, for us to hear uh, global stories, you know, local in Champaign and Urbana, all the way out to, to Kenya and to Liberia. Um, Charles, I think you said it really nicely, you know, it's just good work, good people, you know, just trying to connect the dots for folks. So hopefully, it's okay. Uh, some of the students might come find you on LinkedIn or like connect with you as alums. Uh, I think we've established that if, um, you know, if you've got a, a good intention that, you know, all of us are happy to help and um, hopefully we'll be reading about all the good stuff that the students here are going to go off and do. But again, uh, we appreciate you all's time. Uh, we see this as an investment, you know, in the next generation and um, stories of possibility. Like as designers, we're thinking a lot about what could be and trying to put two and two together in order to make that stuff happen. So um, yeah, we appreciate you spending some time and hanging out with us. Thank you for the questions and the commentary that was put into the chat. And like we uh, say at the end of all of these, uh, what do we say? Drink water, mind your business, uh, be graceful to yourself. Uh, just have a great rest of the week and the weekend. And we've got one more of these for the semester. So we'll see y'all uh, same bat channel, same bat time, same bat place next week. All right. Thank y'all. Much success. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.